I'm gonna go ahead and call the uh, Public Works Committee meeting to order, uh, co-chaired by uh, Council Lady Angie Henderson. Um, and we've got uh, several council members with us, including the uh, uh, floating head of Sherry Weiner in the back. Um, <laughs> So um, in talking with uh, Public Works here, we're gonna have a, about a 30 minute presentation that's gonna be broken down to uh, 10 minutes of side on sidewalks, 10 minutes on bikeways, 10 minutes on traffic calming. Uh, we're gonna ask uh, for the council members that are here to hold your questions until the end. Uh, that way I'll give uh, Jeff and Michael and everybody an opportunity to get through the presentation. And um, I'm willing to stay as long as uh, anybody wants to. I know some, several folks wanna to get to dinner and that's fine, but if anybody wants to stay and ask questions with me, you're welcome to. Um, so we'll start with um, Jeff uh, Hammond and Michael Briggs. If y'all uh, introduce yourselves, and it um, uh, looks like you probably took a charter bus from uh, Public Works, you got so many folks here. Um, but go ahead and um, introduce yourselves and anybody else, and take it away. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the council. We appreciate your uh, time to be with us tonight. It's certainly uh, a topic that's very near and dear to us, an important part of our work, and we're glad that you're interested in it as well. We're going to go cover a lot of information in a relatively short time. Uh, we're going to update you on the work progress uh, that we have, but also our budget status. We're going to talk some about staffing and also uh, some upcoming program changes that we think are really going to help us deliver projects even faster. Uh, we hope this presentation will, will answer a lot of your questions, but we're certainly going to leave plenty of time at the end for any more that you may have. My name is Jeff Hammond. I am a, a manager of the Division of Transportation at Metro Public Works, and, and I'm joined uh, here at the, at the desk by uh, members of the planning department as well, uh, Michael Briggs, uh, Peter Bird with planning department, and also uh, Amanda Neighbors, also with Public Works. So there are a number of others here uh, with us as well, and we will call on them as, as we need to as, uh, as questions arise. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael, and he will begin the presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I, I'm gonna go a little bit through uh, the background and how we got here today, because uh, we've been working on a number of things for, for several years involving uh, sidewalks and bikeways. Um, so a little bit of, if you've been at these meetings before, we're involved in walk and bike, uh, some of it will be a little bit of a refresher or a repeat. Um, We've consistently heard as we've done transportation projects and plans uh, from council members and residents, uh, the need for collaboration, uh, flexibility and transparency. Um, when we're talking about collaboration, it's among departments that are involved in transportation, um, but also collaboration uh, with residents to implement projects. Um, when we're talking about transparency, it involves our own decision-making within Metro the status of projects um, and making sure that we're getting input as we uh, develop projects and plans. Um, we've clearly heard that uh, people wanna know um, what will be implemented and when. And then with flexibility, um, it's something that we need to continue um, to adjust projects based on best practices, um, using money efficiently and address the most pressing needs. Um, so each of these three elements are important to this work when we're talking about sidewalks, bikeways, um, and traffic calming. Um, past mayors have elevated the importance of complete streets. So both Mayor Dean and Mayor Barry had uh, complete streets executive orders. Um, and this is still important uh, to our work within Metro agencies and Metro departments. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in the last couple of years um, looking at complete streets. Uh, planning public works, uh, MTA and parks are coordinating on projects. Um, this includes their selection um, and programming and with on-site construction issues. So looking as uh, issues come up um, with projects, we're trying to work through them. Um, I can attest having been a Metro employee now for eight <coughs> years, our working relationships have uh, really never been better um, around transportation. 
Uh, we have a biweekly DOT uh, or Division of Transportation meeting uh, to discuss specific projects and planning efforts between Public Works Planning and MTA. Um, and in addition to those biweekly meetings, we um, have as needed meetings to discuss sidewalks, bikeways, traffic calming, capital projects, um, and planning studies. So this isn't meant to be uh, digested and sort of uh, dissected um, on your screens, but I wanted to show that involving collaboration, one way that we've been in doing this is integrating our work uh, together and being real intentional about outlining uh, where our work overlaps uh, between planning, public works, um, and MTA in particular. Um, this gets us going in the same direction on our uh, multimodal transportation objectives. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of what we started with last year, um, looking at uh, staffing capacities between the three departments and um, our work objectives. Um, we're finding new ways to perform our work better um, across departments as a team. So. For example, as we design sidewalks, um, our sidewalk consultant will usually present high-level issues uh, to a team involving planning, public works, MTA, and stormwater, and we talk through the major and collector street plan design that's outlined, uh, potential deviations that are appropriate based on um, challenges that we see along the route, um, issues such as bus stop placement um, and crossing issues often come up in those meetings, and we're discussing them um, all together. And so Jeff will now talk about uh, consultants since um, I've brought that, that issue up. Funded at $35 million, the sidewalk and bikeway program constitutes an annual major capital project in its own right. Uh, our Metro staff uh, is very well coordinated as Michael uh, discussed earlier, but we also do rely on consultant help as an extension of our staff to carry out uh, that, that building program. Civic Engineering is our uh, Metro's longstanding program management firm. They've been doing, uh, performing in that capacity for about 15 years. They lead uh, a, a specialized staff across 10 different subconsulting firms uh, consisting of about 70 different individuals, not full time, but uh, as, as work uh, requirements uh, present themselves, uh, there are that many people that on and off work in this sidewalk program. Uh, they work under a five-year contract that expires uh, very soon here in September 2018. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And uh, they, they have performed uh, very capably in that role and we appreciate their help very much. Uh, one of the things that that, that collaborative partnership, uh, not only with Metro staff, but with the, the consulting team allow us to do is, is to make great strides in some of the tools that, that we are tasked with in, in uh, advancing transparency in this program. It's something we're very committed to. And a good example of that is the, uh, the recently released sidewalk and bikeways trackers, which are available online uh, that we already find ourselves using as we deal with constituents uh, asking about um, status of, of those projects. We're going to talk more about that later. But even more basic than that, uh, what these partnerships allow us to do is, is the ability to plan, to design, and construct uh, a $30 million, in the, in the case of sidewalks, a $30 million uh, major capital project every year, year after year. You all have been funding us at about that level for the past three years. And it's not just at one site like a lot of our capital projects uh, are. We're, we're working, uh, we have projects in various stages in roughly 70 sites all across Davidson County. And these are not just sites. Remember that these are people's front yards. And so our teams take this work very seriously. We take that responsibility very seriously. And, and uh, we, we are proud of, of the work we've been able to accomplish. Ms. Neighbors is, is Metro's project manager. She oversees the consultant uh, role in about every phase of, of this work, all the way from project selection through final cleanup of the construction site. And, and it, I won't go through this slide, There's, it's very detailed, but I wanted you to see uh, in a very general way the number of tasks that are required to produce a sidewalk and, and uh, how reliant we are uh, on, on consultant help in, in about every stage of that. Another thing that we prize very much and, and uh, pay a lot of attention to 
because it's, it is an integral part of good plan implementation is flexibility. We use this on a technical side to right size projects to fit sidewalk construction uh, appropriately to the site conditions, but in a more general way, in a more planning, uh, in a more planning uh, scaled way, um, I, I think um, the, the, the talk of the town, as it were, right now, let's move Nashville is a, is a good example of that. And if this passes, it, it will um, undoubtedly change uh, how we prioritize projects. And, and what it might do is with the, the new money coming under the, the Transportation Improvement Program, which would uh, build sidewalks in, in some of these major corridors, it may give us the ability to shift and do other sidewalk work uh, away from these corridors and move those projects up even sooner. Just an example again of how we recognize that flexibility is needed uh, in the planning process. So I'm going to cover some background issues related to sidewalks that came out of the walk and bike uh, planning process uh, before my public works colleagues uh, talk more about funding and project status information. Uh, recall that our mobility plans have used Nashville Next, the city's general plan, to organize where we grow and how we connect places with transit and infrastructure. And every one of these planning efforts have echoed our residents' desire for new sidewalks. Um, you know, that's shown on the screen. It's an issue that is really not controversial um, until sometimes when we get into the construction of sidewalks. Um, but most people are saying we want sidewalks, we want more of them. And so as we undertook in motion the city's transit plan, uh, sidewalks were consistently mentioned, uh, but it was more related to safety. Um, and when we're talking about safety there, it's not uh, that people are afraid of getting on the bus because of security reasons, but it's because of traffic and walking along roads that have no sidewalks or navigating across streets that have uh, traffic going at high speeds. Um, Walk and Bike then tailored its prioritization and scoring to hit on access to transit, to schools, and for transportation purposes. And so similarly, the sidewalk legislation passed by council last year focused on those priorities as well uh, to leverage private development and to construct sidewalks um, in those priority areas or areas that are growing in Nashville next. Uh, walk and Bike was our opportunity to revamp our project development process and it contained several recommendations. Um, most of which um, I covered at the beginning, uh, but it, it helped us flesh out uh, coordination across departments. Um, and so clearly residents and council members want our project selection process to be transparent, uh, produce a list of projects and justify why those projects were chosen, um, and also uh, give reasons as to why some projects may stall or, or be delayed. They're also interested in the costs associated with the projects. Um, we still need the flexibility uh, for when we run into difficult challenges that maybe weren't anticipated during construction to uh, move contractors on to another project sometimes. Uh, but we feel as long as we're transparent um, about uh, the reasons for shifting work or uh, changing priorities, uh, we believe residents and uh, the council will support and appreciate this process. Um, we're wanting to center our selection and transparency um, of projects um, in future years around the status tracker. We think that that's a good communication tool because it clearly outlines our resources and what Metro can deliver um, with um, its funding. Um, I think there's a perception that we can deliver more infrastructure um, than what we can truly build um, year to year. And so with being more transparent about sidewalk projects, it becomes um, even more apparent that projects can be sort of like many road projects. And so this is a good example here um, where a sidewalk project was involving stormwater, right-of-way, um, and driveway impacts. And so communication of these challenges um, is essential to help educate others about uh, the complexity of the projects. Let's talk a little bit about funding uh, now. Uh, over, as I mentioned, over the past three years, this program has been funded very generously uh, at 25 million, 30 million, and 30 million, respectively. The, this this chart shows the progress of the expenditures of those funds. Uh, the, the way to read it is that top bar, which extends, as you see, from July 15, um, it stretches out that first $25 million uh, that we received in, in July of 2016. Um, that, 
money, it took about 30 months to prioritize, design, and ultimately construct those projects. Well, in the middle of while we're doing that, uh, another infusion of, of funding comes in, in July 2016 at 30 million. We begin working on those projects simultaneously. Uh, we, we do a little better. We're a little ahead of the game that year in terms of prioritization. We, we've got a year uh, under our belt at doing that part of it, and, and that took us um, about 26 months. This year, uh, with the funding uh, that we've received, we're, we're uh, anticipating being able to complete uh, or, or to, to expend those funds in about a two-year period, about a 24-month uh, period. We're going to talk more about ways that we want to do even uh, 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 do that work even faster, but I wanted you to be able to see how, how that works. Now, if you look at that and you say, well, if, if, we're, if it's taken us roughly two years to spend one year's worth of funding, we must be sitting on a lot of cash. Uh, that's not the case, and, and so the other thing to look at is we look down uh, vertically through those bars. If you look at the period between July 2017 and, and uh, where we'll be in July 2018, notice that we were, in that calendar year period, we're spending funds out of three different fiscal years money. So we are keeping, uh, keeping our head above water at least in terms of the amount of money uh, that, is being, that is being put into sidewalks on the ground uh, in that way. Another thing that I think it's important to note from this slide is um, as we get funding at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, traditionally we have, we have uh, taken that, those funds and then at that point begin to plan and prioritize what project we're going to work on next. Those early steps in that, con in, that, uh, in that process, the planning, the design, things like right-of-way acquisition, take a lot of time and on a, on a relative, in a relative way, don't take a lot of money. So uh, early on in the pro process, uh, we might spend two-thirds of the time that it takes to ultimately put the sidewalk in and only spend 20% of the money. As we get later in the year in, in that cycle, uh, that flips. And once we move into construction, it doesn't take as much time. It takes about a third of the total time, uh, and we're spending 80% of the funding. So once we can get into that construction uh, phase, we begin to see uh, a lot of that money. And that's kind of where we are at this point uh, in the process here in March 2018 with the fiscal year 17 uh, projects, if that makes sense. So right now we're, we're doing more of the, the planning and the design, early stages of the design in the fiscal year 18 funds. Again, when we get to a slide about things we want to improve, uh, that's, that's another area we think we can see some improvement in. I want to also talk about um, process where we are on the numbers of, of sidewalks. Where we have begun uh, to communicate uh, this is, is that we just have to step into a point in time and talk about this. And so we, we have traditionally been talking about this from January of 2016 to the present where uh, we, we are have completed or are working on roughly 22 miles uh, of sidewalk. Uh, in that in that roughly two uh, two plus year time, it's important to to reference that to something. So if you look at the previous five years prior to this period in 2016, we put in a combined total of 7.8 miles. So we're putting in a lot of sidewalk uh, relative to um, uh, what we had been in the past, and that's again based on on council's commitment to this and and uh, and funding of of these projects. This slide, as well as the one uh, I presented earlier, uh, it, are in front of you in the handout as well. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Neighbors now, and she's going to talk some about uh, the year one list as well as the status tracker. Okay, Let's just, yeah, this, that might be easier. Okay, I'm going to start by talking about year one list. Right now we have 35 projects planned. Right now we're working through the final approvals on those and you should be, we should be reaching out to you soon if we have not already. Um, and in the future, to kind of speed up the process of us picking projects, we're looking at making, and we've already developed a five-year list that will be updated annually. So every year we're gonna reevaluate the five-year list and see what have changed, what new developments are coming in, and kind of look at an overall picture. I'm going to go to the sidewalk tractor and kind of give you a quick demo. I'm not sure how many people have had a chance to look at it. Meaning this coming year or are you re reflecting back? Um, Mr. Hammond was 
looking at past budget years. So when you say year one, what time frame are you speaking of? That would of? be from 2017 to 2018. Okay. So that's the funding that we received in June. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna start by talking. If you notice, you can see the map and there's, can, oh. Yes. So just for the viewing public, as you all try to pull that up, where can folks now find this sidewalk tracker online? Can somebody speak to that, where folks would go to find that? It is on the uh, Metro Public Works um, website. It's mpw.nashville.gov um, slash sidewalks. Okay, mpw.nashville.gov slash walk and bike with or an slash sidewalk or slash sidewalks mm -hmm. okay okay and the walk and bike uh has the bike wise in it as well mm -hmm. so good to know thank you yeah i may have to go back to the slides and kind of Perfect. You're okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, after some a little bit of technical difficult. Okay. So first, I'm going to start by kind of going at, off the grid. You'll have a list. It shows all the different colors, and I wanted to point out that it has complete. And then, if you look down a little bit, it says um, planned, and those are the 2017-2018 sidewalks. So at this point, those have not started design. Once we get the final approval of those, those will move into design. So I'm gonna start by kind of pointing out a few projects or different ways you can search for projects. So first you can zoom in in a location. So if you're looking for a general area and what sidewalk projects are in that location, you can zoom into that area, click on that particular sidewalk project. So we're going to start by clicking on Not Brian Livingston. And under the sidewalk tracker, you're going to have a typical section. And that's going to show you how wide the grass strip is as well as how wide the sidewalk is. Also, this one's in construction, so we'll have some recent construction pictures for you to see as well. Um, and then if you look down a little bit farther, there's the plans. So if anybody wants to see what the actual plans look like for the project, those are online as well. And then some other in interesting information. You have the purchase order amount. So whatever we issued, this is to Roy T. Goodwin is our sidewalk contractor. So it has the amount that their PO is. And then through the project milestones, you have each step that we've completed to get to this process. And then at every pre-construction meeting we have, we give a handout and that is also on here as well. And it has your contact information for anybody for the inspector 
as well as the contractor's representative on site, and it also has my contact information. And this is for constituents if they have any questions or concerns. They have a number straight to the people who are actually working on the project out in the field. And then another good bit of information on this is ha it also has the um, scheduled construction finish date. This one is May 10th. So you can give, and we'll be updating this throughout the process. One other thing I kind of want to point out is the different ways you can search the information. You can look down here and click on the council district and you can sort it. So if you want to look for every project, for example, in council district one, that is listed and you can look down through the list and pick whichever project you like. Also, you can search by your council member. And this shows all the particular projects that are in, under that one council member. So there's lots of different ways to search. And I wanted to point out one more thing on this before we go on to the next thing. And we also have a note section on the sidewalk. Apologize, I clicked on the wrong one. And I'm gonna go to the very bottom. Let's see. If there's any delays on the project, there is a note section you can see at the very bottom and it says if there's a change in the construction date, anything like that, it tells you the reasoning why that we moved it. So on this one, this is Franklin Avenue in Brett Weathers Council District and we've had some issues with coordination with utilities. So this is listed, so if you have any questions about what's causing a delay. Right. Well, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeff. For the sake of time, I just want to go through a couple of these um, uh, ways that we we are excited to uh, to be planning to um, speed up the the construction of sidewalk projects. I uh, would I would um, I like uh, I would ask you to focus on the third and fourth bullets here. As I mentioned, the uh, contracts are expiring this summer for both our program manager and our uh, lead contractor on on the. Uh, program, we're going to use this as an opportunity to reevaluate how we do this work and it, are there any construction methods that we can use to progress projects faster to completion. And, and two of the things that we're looking at, one is, is um, investigation of the design build principle. And you may be familiar with design build, but uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but it has some, it can have some real advantages when it comes to uh, not only cost of projects, but for us, most importantly, the time to get those projects uh, to completion. And then the other part of that is um, a, a project manager um, tweak to the, the contracting mechanism there, uh, where that, that person serves um, as Metro's uh, representative in, in various aspects of the sidewalk construction. We hope that combination of some contracting changes that's coming out very soon uh, will be a real benefit to uh, the, uh, the completion of these projects. I'm going to talk now about uh, the bikeways program and Peter Bird from the planning department will kick it off. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, to start with an update on the, bi on the bikeways program, I just want to emphasize that this is our first year implementing the walk-in bike plan, and it's also the first year we've been able to operate on the $5 million allocation that council has made for us. And so, um, yeah, we can keep, do I have a clicker? There we go. And so what I wanted to start with is to emphasize the different types of bikeways that the walk-in bike plan recommends. And you've, you've probably seen this before, but the three major types are major protected bikeways, minor protected bikeways, and then neighborways. And the emphasis point is that 
Um, on major protected bikeways, there's something physical that separates where you're biking from where the travel lanes are, where cars are going. And so it's really appropriate on our busier streets that have higher speeds, more traffic, more lanes. Minor protected bikeways can have the buffer like you see on this picture, or it can just be the single white painted line. And those ones are most appropriate on kind of your medium streets. A lot of collectors, especially in neighborhoods where you want some separation, but you don't have as high of volumes, as high of speeds. And then finally, neighborways, which, um, which are most appropriate on already quiet neighborhood streets. And with those ones, it's really focusing on traffic calming on the street instead of separation. And so if you're on a bicycle or if you're walking on the sidewalk, you feel more comfortable with the cars in the same space because they're going 20 miles an hour or so. But what's really important in the neighbor way is that it should involve traffic calming, physical changes to the street, and not just be um, signs and paint. And so this is kind of a map of our existing bike facilities. And the, the two biggest takeaways on here are that there are a lot of shared routes. Um, and a lot of those, you can kind of see in the map, but a lot of those are on busier arterial streets. Um, and then the other takeaway is that, um, is that this has largely been developed from following the paving program, which is something that the bikeways program did really because we had less funding. We weren't able to do the, the larger scale planning. We didn't have a master plan to work from. And so it's been a lot of projects of opportunity, um, which was great to be able to have that. But where we're moving now is being able to, to really be more intentional and, and follow a master plan in selecting facilities. And so this is a map of our 2017 and 2018 projects. The green lines are the, from the previous slide of the existing bikeways, but you can see in blue and I believe kind of a pinkish coral color on there, yeah. Um, those are representing the, uh, the projects we have this year that are bikeway projects as well as neighborway projects, which we broke out just to show that um, some of them are separated and some of them are really that shared use kind of area. And what you can see in the pie charts up there is that we have more of an emphasis on major protected bike lanes. And we did also break out between bike lanes and minor protected, just the difference between having the buffer and not having the buffer. But what I wanna also emphasize is that um, in being more selective of projects, the, the mileage delineation in itself can be a little bit deceiving because we're doing more difficult projects that a mile downtown or a mile in a downtown neighborhood is much more difficult than a mile if you're further out and you're just kind of following paving on there. And then from a, um, really working into the community engagement piece of it, working into the design and the engineering, which on here, each of those is nine months and that kind of encapsulates all three of those stages. We broke the overall projects for this year into three different phases that overlap with each other. Yeah, and if we zoom in here, you can see the, color, the corresponding colors to those different phases. And so the way with this working, um, phase one projects would be able to start with the community engagement. And then as we finish that around three month um, process, and that would move into more of the design and eventually in the construction, we can start doing the community engagement for the second phase of projects. And what's, what's missing on here, because we zoomed in, the phase three projects are ones that are a little further outside from this map that we, um, we wanted to have a couple of neighborway projects connecting to you know, core destinations, whether it's um, a school or a greenway. And those ones are in um, Bellevue and Lenox Village and then around Smith Springs, closer to Percy Priest. But, um, sorry, can you go back one? Yeah, uh, I wanted to say also that um, that we, we ended up starting a little bit later on this schedule than we would have liked to at the beginning. And a lot of that was on us that we didn't have the list really finalized and developed as much as we would have liked to. And so um, that list was finalized around February. And that's where you can see that the process beginning. And we feel like we'll be able to finish all the projects, have those constructed, completed within the next calendar year from there. But the takeaway being that for our year two projects, we have a list that's ready to go right now, or that, we, or that we've submitted that we know the projects are. And so once we have funding for that, once we know we can move forward, that process will begin earlier. And instead of beginning at February and going to February, that's something we can begin later this year in the, in the fall and the winter, and hopefully be able to still keep that 12 month timeline. And then I'll go into the next slide with our 2018 and 19 plan bikeways. And so the, the two charts on here correspond the same as the, um, as the ones for, for the 2017-18 projects. But what I wanna emphasize on this slide, and if we can zoom in here, you can see a little more detail, is that while the 2017 and 18 bikeways are really focusing on North Nashville and West Nashville, with a couple other projects like 12th Avenue South that were a major corridor, 
Um, we took kind of a corollary approach to this one and focus, we're focusing on East Nashville, on South Nashville, and then downtown projects, with the idea being that if we can batch projects together, and this was a recommendation of the walk and bike plan, that it's easier to go into a neighborhood and really be able to, to have a network that's usable pretty immediately. And within this two-year time frame, we have the bones of a pretty, of a pretty, a pretty strategic um, a bikeway network downtown and within downtown, uh, downtown core suburbs that we can eventually be building out from, connecting to greenways, connecting to schools. And so um, when we have projects that are mile for mile, they're more difficult than if it's just following a paving program, it demands a lot more of a robust community engagement strategy, which is the approach we've taken. Uh, the three months, it really focuses on talking to people early and often. We go in and we talk before we have any designs on the table, before we start working on that to understand what the needs are, what the gaps are, if there are gaps in pedestrians being able to cross the street or traffic calming needs that are outside of bikeways but that we can address simultaneously. It's a really good opportunity for us to have that information, which is what you see on those, on those slides before we get into the design. And these are just a few other examples um, from a meeting we had recently with the Rosebank neighbors, and that was talking about Riverside Drive, which wasn't on the previous map because it was a paving project they were able to, to tag onto that was strategic um, in advancing the plan. And then the second one at Elizabeth Park Senior Center to, pro to talk about some of our projects in North Nashville. And I'll turn that over to Michael. So as, as we've undertaken studies or an implementation of projects, um, We've run into some hurdles in the last year. Um, and we've essentially done, uh, if we can communicate this to you all tonight, we've done the low-hanging fruit within Metro in Nashville, uh, involving sidewalks and bikeways. And so we're designing much more uh, involved and complex sidewalk projects because we are trying to meet the major and collector street plan design criteria, utility relocations, property acquisition issues that come up. And we no longer have many bike lanes uh, that make meaningful connections that do not impact uh, the number of travel lanes. Um, and if you've tracked the 8th Avenue study last year, just having the conversation about how we might best make our travel lanes more efficient as a road is repaved um, caused a tremendous amount of anxiety. Um, and we have struggled with who the street is designed for. Um, is it for those that live and work within the corridor or those that travel through the corridor? Um, there were a lot of assumptions about decisions being made already. Uh, where we were truly wanting to have a conversation about how best to optimize uh, the street. Um, and it unfortunately resulted in us doing nothing, um, which isn't best for traffic either. Um, Cleveland Street bike lanes are another project um, where we didn't do our best job of notifying uh, council members of the project and, and neighbors were very vocal about keeping conditions as is. Um, and so this was a road in East Nashville where traffic counts um, are low and simply going from four lanes to three lanes got pushed back um, when a stop sign was removed. Um, and in both instances, um, emotions sort of drove the conversation um, instead of data, um, engineering expertise, looking at safety considerations and thinking about opportunities to improve conditions for for all people. Um, and so these projects often where someone feels like something is being taken away, um, but we're, we're oftentimes typically making the road and trying to make it more efficient from uh, when it was uh, developed um, in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s. And as you all know, Nashville has changed tremendously since then. Um, and the way we get around um, has changed. And so these projects require uh, multiple meetings and they require meetings early on and um, having conversations with the community. And so this not only applies to sidewalks and bikeways, but it also goes into traffic calming. And so Jeff and Peter are gonna update you all on the traffic calming program. Traffic calming is very much a separate program. Uh, it is not funded as part of the sidewalk or bikeway program, but as, as the examples uh, Michael mentioned there, alluded to, it is very much uh, an associated program. Um, it is funded uh, instead as uh, out of the traffic management uh, budget that Public Works receives each year. This is a, a program that has a very high degree of constituent interaction, as you might imagine, and uh, the very capable consulting team that helps us with that is led by KCI Technologies. Uh, a subconsultant to them is, is Collier Engineering, and those firm, two firms work together collaboratively uh, in, in uh, the um, 
uh, application of this program. KCI has, has a five-year contract uh, that expires in August of 2020. Uh, this help is needed because we currently have 32 active uh, neighborhoods uh, engaged within this program. This is not a one time we go meet and, and it's done. This is an ongoing process where multiple meetings uh, are required and, and Peter will talk more about that process. Um, I would also say in the period between January and March of this year, we have 43 new requests, which puts us on pace to have our busiest year ever in the traffic calming program. One of the things we recognize is that over the past couple of years, this program has, has been largely reactive and, and the, the effectiveness of the tools that we are applying in these neighborhoods uh, has, has, uh, has been fairly low, uh, really relegated to um, additional speed limit signs, some pavement markings that reinforce the, the speed limit and those types of things. We're, we're beginning to move away from just uh, the markings. We, we continue to think those are important, but beginning to, to uh, use more aggressive um, uh, traffic calming countermeasures to achieve our goals. Uh, about six months ago, a little bit more maybe, uh, we began uh, a, a process to overhaul this program and, and really begin to look for more creative uh, uh, ways to, to implement traffic calming in neighborhoods. Um, a, a couple of examples of that, walking districts in, <clears throat> in Hillsborough West End, Cleveland Park and Antioch, uh, temporary traffic circles in the Belmont Hillsborough neighborhood, uh, as well as the 12 South neighborhood. We have, as uh, is, is on the screen now, a, a, uh, a, a buffered multi-use path in the Nippers Corner area. Uh, rumble strips in several locations. We're now working on uh, uh, speed cushions in, in Glen Rose, traffic circles in Bellevue, and, and the list continues um, uh, as we have uh, time and budget to, to uh, address those 32 existing neighborhoods in the program. We're still refining this process. This is very much a work in progress. We're in the middle of it now, and to do so, uh, we asked uh, the planning department led by Mr. Bird to organize a team to look at best practices from across the United United States uh, at this type of work and develop some recommendations uh, for us to use in this new program. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I want to say first of all that this flowchart on here is something that's still in development. We, we haven't really shown it too much yet. And so it's, um, you know, there are th still things in there we can change, we can tweak. But overall what it reflects is, like Jeff said, really trying to revamp how we look at traffic calming, how we administer that program, and how we talk to people about it. Um, and so the, the traffic calming tax, task force that we had between planning and public works really looked at a number of different kind of overarching issues as part of the program, looking at the process, looking at policy, looking at selection criteria, um, including prioritization, methodology, kind of coming up with different ways that we can empirically um, or objectively score different applications that we are receiving, uh, creating a toolbox of, of traffic calming measures that can be on the table. And, and also looking at communication methods uh, between metro, metro government, metro, metro staff and consultants, and, and the public generally. And so to get into some of the selection criteria, we really wanted to focus on, on seeing how we can identify where the limited, or where, where the money that we have for traffic calming, how that can be most effective. We know that there's a need. We get, like Jeff mentioned, a lot of different applications, people who want to see that in their neighborhoods. And so trying to find a way that, that really lets us um, better understand how, where, where the greatest need is and how we can allocate that uh, intentionally. And so looking at things like, uh, sorry, the vulnerable users, neighborhood destinations, proximity to active transportation, crash history, and then the raw traffic data of speeds and volumes. And this, is, this isn't meant for you to read it right, for to go through all of this right now, but it's kind of an idea of the toolkit. When we get into changing the street physically to slow cars down, to, to lower those volumes, it's kind of a combination of these three things, having pinch points, surface treatments like the um, like speed tables, speed cushions where you raise that surface, and then addressing intersections uh, with, with different treatments, including, including um, neighbor traffic circles. There's this, uh, this example right here. And so that tra or the that toolkit will have will have a number of different options or different treatment types that fit those three different categories, and will include things like a you know an image of what that could look like, a description of the treatment, some fast facts that that look at what impacts there are to, to emergency vehicles, to parking, to transit, 
to say where it's most appropriate and then also give some advantages and disadvantages um, so the public can look and see what, what may be a good fit to really address what the needs are on their streets. And then we'll also be looking at how we can better communicate with people um, about these meetings themselves. And as we get into this uh, newer, more updated traffic calming program and, and start looking instead of, instead of solely at kind of individual spot improvement requests, but how traffic calming addresses an entire neighborhood or entire area, it'll be increasingly important to make sure that the people who are most affected by it are aware of the process to identify what the needs are, to come up with solutions, and then install those. Also recognizing that the more you physically change the street, the more impact that's gonna have on the people who actually live there. And that's where the, this petition comes in, and this is kind of just an example where if we were doing a major treatment, like a, like a traffic circle or like a speed cushion, that we would want um, kind of a, a certain percentage, and we haven't defined what that is yet, but of people who live right on that street to sign on that they're in favor of that. It's something that, um, that allows us to, to better involve the residents and neighbors in what the treatments are, but then it also ensures that the people who are at the front door of what the treatment is that's going in, that they're aware and that they're, um, that they're on board with what that looks like. And so at the conclusion of all three of those sections, I think we're ready to open up to questions. We are. Thank you for your attention. All right, well, we'll open for questions. Council Lady Henderson, do you have, do you wanna start us off with any questions you might have? Um, certainly, um, thank you all so much. Um, this is, is really encouraging to see. Um, I was fortunate to represent the council on the walk and bike uh, steering committee. Um, and then just through my uh, neighborhood work, um, uh, had been engaged with you know the traffic calming program um, over the years, and as you all know, had had some criticisms of that program. Um, and so I, I genuinely appreciate the the extent to which you all are looking at um, process and delivery and all these things really across the board in all the programs. It's really encouraging, and um, and uh, so I appreciate that. Um, let me ask. Um, Traffic calming from a from a budgetary standpoint, um, Mr. Hammond, you uh, were sharing that um, you know where we break out sidewalks in the budget and we break out bikeways in the budget. We have not traditionally uh, broken out uh, traffic calming separately because in the past that's somewhat been incorporated into our paving program. And so, um, can you speak to that as this committee kind of looks ahead to budget season and what would be based on your project volume. Um, do you, what are your suggestions in that regard from a budgetary perspective of how to kind of look at that program and be able to plan accordingly um, and, and proactively? Um. Well, uh, I can. Like so many things, traffic calming is one of those things where we don't tell you we have to have a, a minimum amount of money in order to do this work. We, we, can, we can perform traffic calming at a level at which we are funded, for better or worse. And so if we have uh, $500,000 to spend throughout the year, that's what we'll do, and, and we, will, we will tailor our program to, to that, that amount of money. If we have much more than that, we can do more work. Uh, the only the only caveat I would say to that is, and, and this happened in, in the last uh, uh, funding cycle, uh, we did go without for some period of time. We cannot, we made the decision we cannot quit answering the phones when people call. This is a, a set program. It's a very popular program. We have to do a minimum amount of work to keep the doors open so that people can continue to call. We can continue to investigate those needs at a very basic level to determine, do we have a, a very dire safety need which may or may not exist out there? Ascertain that, make that decision, and then, and then move on, uh, move uh, accordingly with that. So we, we, uh, as we, as we came out of that, that was funded in the interim budget, uh, again under a, a traffic management uh, plan, and so we have set funding aside to use for traffic calming programs. So, in the in the current um, uh, budget request, we have we have requested one million dollars to do traffic calming and what we call Vision Zero projects which are, are dedicated projects just looking at some of those highest safety needs uh, that uh, really focus on pedestrian activity, those being our most vulnerable roadway users and where a, a inordinate number of fatalities occur. So uh, that's the current funding request, but again, uh, we, we use the, the amount of, of funding and, and stretch it as far as we can. 
And for that one million number, did you take into account like the, the 43 new requests? I think what we as council members are hearing, while we definitely appreciate that, you know, the, the pipeline for the sidewalk projects is improving and that's kind of coming online um, to Mr. Uh, Briggs's point, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit in the sidewalk space um, has, uh, not entirely countywide, but, you know, I, I hear from neighbors as it relates to kind of our, our traffic concerns um, and, you know, out in our more suburban areas with a more sprawled development pattern where, you know, sometimes the math really doesn't work for sidewalks, that these kind of on-street treatments um, and traffic calming, if we can calm those streets and make a, you know, shared space where people can walk more safely. So, you know, historically we've said, okay, we can service this many numbers of neighborhoods um, and look at rolling those out. Um, but from a, from a scale standpoint, you know, as to, to staffing and otherwise, I mean, does one million meet the need of just what's in the queue? But then, you know, as this program becomes more successful and people realize that it, it actually um, is, is working well, you'll have all the more neighborhoods coming to us as council members. So um, can you speak to that um, just a little bit more? I believe so, I'll try. I, I, I think another uh, number that I'll throw out that's kind of important to help understand that the scale of this is, as we over the past few months have been doing a little more aggressive pro, uh, projects, speed cushions, um, um, some traffic circle work, um, some of those types of, of things, we have recognized, certainly the cost goes up, that's, that's right. relatively much more expensive than just posting a few more added speed limit signs or painting that uh, messaging on the pavement. Um, we're now to where we believe a, 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 a uh, responsible uh, a form of, of traffic control in a neighborhood might run in the order of 50 to, to anywhere from 50 to $100,000 mm -hmm. per treatment. Yeah. And so, you know, if we're looking at that million dollar number, uh, it might get us in 10 neighborhoods, it might get us in, in twice that amount, um, but, you know, it probably won't handle to that degree all, all of the neighborhoods that are in that queue. But we're also not sure that we need to do that. You right. know, that, as Understood. we get through the, the permitting, pro I mean, the, uh, the petition process and all that, that Peter spoke to, sometimes those neighborhoods fall out. And, and we, really, we really like to have a lot of skin in the game, as it were, from those neighborhoods, um, um, you know, to, to help us in, in the, the, uh, the implementation and valuation of those things. So we think it is a good middle of the road number, uh, you know, and, and again, we also don't have the history of funding in the traffic calming program that we do in the sidewalks. So it's a little bit harder to speak to how far will this money go and, and what might we do with it. Thank you. Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for being in here. And I, I am uh, especially uh, excited about uh, sidewalk and bikeway tracker and um, abundance of information. And it's, it's great. And especially uh, all the notes and where they are. And so anybody can click on it and being able to see where it is, it's very, very helpful. And I appreciate that. So on that note, and you know, each council member have so many wish lists, like yes, I do have this street to be the next uh, priority and so forth. So the, the sidewalk uh, trucker, the one we see is currently on the project on your uh, program. Is that right? So it's like a, a phase one, phase two, phase three. So the sidewalks, it did not even make that your phase list will not be on that list. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> that's correct. I mean, everything that's in the sidewalk tracker is one of two things. Either it is, it is a funded project that is somewhere in the design or construction phase, or it is something that uh, we also, it, it is funded. We know there's money allocated towards it. It may not be encumbered yet, meaning we haven't actually cut a purchase order and have somebody working, but, but we have uh, uh, um, allocated funds to that project but they're still just planned. And so as, as um, we were going through the sidewalk tracker and you saw all those blue colored planned ones, we know in a lot of cases with council members, those are not done deals. And so we continue to have those discussions with those individual council persons to make sure that we're working in, in, in accordance with what they wanna do. And at the same time, very importantly, that we're working in accordance with the walk and bike plan. So anytime we go in and, and have those discussions, 
we've always got in, in our pocket, you know, what the walk and bike score it is, how good of a project, and, and that's that's really foremost for us is we want to make sure we're working in accordance with that. And then if and then you know as we can take requests and and uh, you know reason through that with those persons, that's what we like to do. Uh, my another question is uh, on the bikeways, uh, especially on the maintenance. You know, especially uh, in my area, we do have uh, wonderful Music City uh, bikeways, and some portion is kind of a little bit stripped of the some neighbor's front yard. And sometimes, you know, people comes in and cut the grass, or sometimes, you know, some people throw the trash, and so it will be kind of in danger to the bikers. So w is there any program to clean up or consistently maintain those uh, bikeway to be safe for the bikers? Uh, go ahead, Peter. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we, we have allocated funding for maintenance on projects every year, but one thing we recognize is that the more bikeways we have, especially the more major protected bikeways we have, the more difficult and the more expensive that's going to that's become. Because um, if you have major protected bikeways where you have that physical barrier, all of a sudden a, a traditional street sweeper has a difficult time getting in there and so it actually can necessitate getting specialized bike lane equipment to be able to do things like that. And so that's something that we're gonna be, um, I think every year that cost is gonna continue to go up as well. It's, we've accommodated it, but we recognize that it's gonna get higher as well. Um, Ms. Wallstrom, can you speak to, we have brought that up in, um, I guess, 4% conversations. Um, I had requested a bike lane specific uh, sweeper. Um, I know you all looked at that and researched that and thought perhaps your, your contractor who does uh, the sweeping might uh, acquire one of those. Could you speak to that? We, we have looked at that and we have talked with our current contractor and we've gotten a price for that and that is one of the budget modifications that we put in for this year. And, does that and to request the money to pay for a sweeper for only the bikeways with our contractor. Okay, and so that looks at what we have on the ground currently and then what we would intend to build in the protected space. Current and year. some projected. Okay, great. So. Thank you. Okay. I've got a couple of questions. I guess one is um, if... I know you said uh, like the past three years, you've, it's been 25, 30, and then 30 million for sidewalks. Um, but years prior to that, um, it's been very up and down. And I think I know the answer to this, but I want to, I guess, get it on the record. What would it be, I guess, a, a, the advantages to having a steady, I guess, a consistent number budgeted every year for sidewalks? How could that, you know, get things delivered faster or that kind of thing? What, what would it be like if we, for y'all, if we, if you knew every year there was going to be at least $30 million in sidewalks? Well, the, I, I think the first thing that, that we would begin to do is to talk not only about what we want to do this year with the fiscal year 18 uh, projects. We could go ahead and have that discussion for a couple of years in advance, knowing that, um, you know, we have some assurance that that, that work is going to be able to progress and we're, we have a longer planning time then to work through uh, those issues. I, I think that's that's the main thing. Uh, it also, that that theory then ripples all the way down through our, uh, our consultant and probably more importantly, our contractor labor forces, that they have some assurance that this work is coming, that if they staff up, they can keep those crews busy. Uh, that has been, uh, frankly, a, a, one of the issues we've dealt with in the past is, is it, it, we take longer into any time there's a delay in design or some holdup in the field it ripples all the way through the project to where, um, you know, if, if those things are big enough or, or uh, enough of a disruption, you know, those contractors begin to lose subcontractors. As we know, Nashville has plenty of construction work uh, for everyone, it seems, right now. And, and, and frankly, we have a hard time keeping those, those uh, uh, contractors on our jobs if we can't, you know, deliver to them uh, a, a large body of work uh, so that they can feel comfortable confident, confident uh, hiring crews to continue to move water lines, m relocate utilities, all the things that's required of that. So uh, it would be a real benefit, uh, I think, for at least those two reasons. And I guess, um, to Courtney uh, mentioned to me earlier that no council member asked any questions ahead of time. So, I want, but this is what I'm about to ask. Probably should have been included in that. But what uh, do y'all know offhand? What has been the breakdown? Like we have, you know, 25, 30, 30 
million dollars for Sidle. What has been the breakdown the past two, three, four years on the traffic calming? I know, you know, you, we went. Uh, I think it was the last budget year we didn't put any in there, but I think there's some in the 4%. Um, but could you do that breakdown of the up and down that we've been funding that program? Well, it, that's, a, that's a fairly difficult question because it has never been funded as a line item in our budget. There, okay. there really is no such thing as a, a traffic calming uh, uh, budget. It, it comes as part of, of our traffic management program. So it's the same pot of money that goes to new uh, traffic signals, rebuilding traffic signals, safety at, at certain intersections, even remarking roads, re-signing roads, all of that comes out of a traffic management budget. So any, any work that's dedicated toward traffic calming uh, is, is done in a discretionary way out of that pool. Now I would also say this, we look to be as efficient as we can in the administration of those funds. So for instance, as, as we're, we're working with planning on doing neighborways or other bicycle work, we also recognize that that has a, a, a pretty significant traffic calming uh, aspect as well. And so the lines get a little blurry. There's, there's, a, there's a, a different ways that we can fund things and, and we try to make best use of those keeping uh, with the intent of council when it gives us five million dollars of bikeways we're going to spend that five million dollars on bikeways if we can also achieve a traffic calming aspect uh, to that it's more so the better uh, but it also we get some we get some efficiencies in return in the consulting uh, use of that and, and going out and, and and so there's a lot of bleed over between processes and and things from both the traffic calming aspect and uh, predominantly the, the bikeways, maybe to, to a lesser extent, the sidewalk. I was also gonna add, um, you know, we're looking at it in planning too as development comes in. So similar as to the requirements for sidewalks, um, we're starting to look at the walk and bike plan um, for when a development comes in to see if there are elements of the bikeway network that can be implemented as part of leveraging that private development investment. Um, we've had a couple of examples, uh, most recently, I think at 19th and Chet Atkins, there was a, a mixed use development there where they're able to go in and uh, one of the requirements of their approval is to uh, come up with the paving, uh, striping and signing plan for uh, several of the streets through there that would make uh, several roads in that, that sort of grid of that portion between Music Row and West End into the neighborway network there. Um, and so we're looking at opportunities as development comes in to start um, looking at traffic calming, uh, some of the bikeway networks and start leveraging some of that development um, and requiring that. The other thing that we're also tossing around that we haven't completely fleshed out is part of the traffic impact studies that are being developed with developments, um, looking at uh, traffic calming uh, as part of that um, requirement as well. Um, one other thing related to traffic calming that I thought I would mention, um, the equity issue I think has come up with this where um, we oftentimes have neighborhoods that are more savvy with the system, can usually go in and request these services a lot easier than, than maybe areas that, that aren't quite as savvy or just aren't aware of the program. Um, so we're looking to develop an application then that um, can be submitted. Um, and so we hope through the council members and through neighborhood leader networks that uh, that information, that message gets out there and that we begin to get some areas maybe where we haven't seen um, requests for traffic calming where we know there's a need that they, they begin looking at that as a potential solution. Just as a follow-up, I guess, to, to Jeff or whoever, if so it sounds like to not have it, I guess, as a line item in the budget is, you know, you're able to use some of the different, for the lack of a better term, pots of money or parts, you know, designated for different areas. But would it be good or bad to have a line item in the budget just for traffic calming? Or is it better to have it kind of, you know, split up among the different um, parts of the budget? If you don't know the answer, no, that's fine. I was just maybe putting you on the spot a little bit. But I'm, this is something I know. Uh, anyways, go ahead. No, it's okay. I, I don't know if it's either good or bad. I, I mean, uh, you know, when we have it as a big pot, um, you know, we do our best to, to administer those and, and meet those most critical needs as best we can. So if, if traffic calming leads us into, hey, you know, what we really need to do is put a traffic signal here, all of a sudden 
uh, you know, we leave the world of traffic calming and, and pull out of a traffic signal pot and it's two different pots of money. It, it, in a lot of ways, we like having that flexibility, you know, as one pot of money to decide, you know, how we spend that and what goes where. Um, we serve it at, at the pleasure of the mayor's office and at, at, at council. And so, you know, if it is given to us as, just like it is in sidewalks or bikeways, as here is money to spend on traffic calming and only on traffic calming, we're glad to do that too. Uh, but, but there are some advantages for us to have a little more flexibility in those, in, in those funds. Anyway, Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, Couple of questions. Uh, one is, are, are we prepared today to have a discussion about sidewalk and loo fees in the BZA process, or is that uh, an appropriate topic for this particular meeting, or would that warrant a separate meeting? Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, that can be within the realm of discussion. I mean, I think if we, you know, Mr. Hammond gave us a uh, sidewalk cost information sheet, and I know, um, you know, with the fee in lieu of sidewalks increasing this year um, with the new uh, legislation that, that has heightened people's kind of concern or interest around the cost of sidewalks. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can, we can get into that because that relates also to, um, uh, you know, implementation and, right. and from budgetary perspective, sure. Um, if that is appropriate, then maybe we can hold that thought for just a moment uh, and get back to that uh, when it's appropriate. I did want to get back a little bit to the matter of the neighborhood uh, traffic calming, the neighborhood approach, which I think is really good, um, because sometimes when you implement something on one street, the problem moves to the next adjacent street sometimes. So I, I really appreciate that approach. Um, I guess one of the things I'm wondering is if uh, someone could on the staff could send council members just refresh us of where the neighborhoods are that are on that list currently so that we're aware um, and then we can kind of follow up on that um, also I wanted to get a little bit of clarification for the neighborhood traffic calming I know we have a few neighborhoods that have the pilot program where it has the the signage and, and some of those other things. Um, just as a general statement, do we have some sense right now about um, how effective that has been with the signage and the markings changes um, absent, let's say, police presence? Do we, like, how is that going? Is there a, an opinion so far? Okay. Um, uh, let, me, let me answer the first question this way when you ask where those neighborhoods are. Um, every Friday, Public Works, uh, Courtney Stone, uh, our, um, our engagement officer, sends out updates on that. Those uh, have recently been added probably only about the past two or three weeks. So if you go to, I'm not sure how deep they are in that list, but we have started to put traffic calming progress in that. So um, I've got the list here. I can read through them, but it is, thir it is 32 um, uh, locations long. I'd be glad to do that. But if, if maybe if you could, I, I know there aren't a whole lot of council members here today, unfortunately, but maybe if someone could send us a, just that list to all of us that we would all know, and that might save a lot of questions to you and absolutely. your staff. Uh, we can certainly do that. And, and then activity then again is shown every Friday on that, uh, on that public works update. The, que the second question about the walking districts, um, we met just today, as a matter of fact, to get some preliminary feedback on, on the, the data. We're collecting two types of data. We, we've got, uh, uh, we've, it's probably 75% in, but until we get that last, um, I, I don't wanna say too much about it, uh, lest it, it skew what we're finding so far, but we're, we're collecting two forms of, of data. One is, is um, quantitative, where Obviously, we're going back out and measuring the speed to find did, did it have an appreciable impact on speeds or not. The second one, which um, um, as an engineer, I typically would say is not important, but increasingly it is becoming much more important, maybe, maybe equivalent uh, in importance, which is um, qualitative data, which we asked the residents, how did you feel about it? You know, it, regardless of what the, the numbers say, did you feel more comfortable getting out and walking or biking? Or, you know, did you feel like this change was too slow? Is it still too fast? What did you think? And so we're getting that information back as well. That's where we've, we've only got two thirds. Uh, we'd like a bigger sample on that. And really one neighborhood is, uh, has very little participation in that to this point. We've only had it out again about a month. So we'd like to get a little more information from them. Um, so that, inf that 
information is going to be coming very soon, and I think it is going to spur again the conversation of are walk-in districts necessary? Should we do this in certain areas? Should it be countywide? What did the data show? We're continuing to, to look at informing uh, our recommendations on all of those issues, and so there'll be more information coming about that. That's great, and that's, that really is what I was looking for. I know there is, um, uh, I hear from a lot of constituents that, uh, and, and I tend to agree that, frankly, just lowering speed limits in and of itself tends to have a lot, of, a lot of benefit for communities, but it may not address all of it. But perhaps once that data comes in, well, we'd have a little bit better way to differentiate what was the most effective thing it, in, in addition to lowering the speed limit that was, that was useful. Um, with that, um, uh, Chairwoman uh, Henderson, if, if, if you feel it's appropriate, I, I would be interested in hearing how uh, things are going with the in lieu fee collection and the BZA hearing process. If we, maybe if we have any trends that have emerged from those kind of uh, analyses and just any anything on that just to let us know how that's going I would I would appreciate an update on that so what I will share just for a frame of reference we are I guess about nine months in um, right since the effective date of the new sidewalk legislation being last July 1st um, and in anticipation of coming up on that that year uh, in uh, uh, the planning department Michael Briggs mr. Gonzalez have uh, kindly been compiling um, the data to see kind of what patterns are we seeing, uh, what are the challenges, um, getting feedback. So we're just beginning that process in anticipation of kind of coming up on a year. Um, that would be the time where we would take that stakeholder input, look at the data, and potentially come up uh, with some with some updates. Um, so, you know, Mr. Briggs, I don't know if you want to expand on that, but then um, additionally, I think, uh, and that might kind of circle us back to walk and bike and implementation, um, I think there is always, you know, kind of the, the lingering question about uh, of sidewalk cost, um, because that, you know, that is in the legislation every July 1st, um, you know, an average of these projects to, you know, to get to um, a, a, a fair fee. Um, and, you know, we've got some handouts here that speak to uh, how high the cost is for Metro. And I know we all hear from constituents like, wow, it costs Metro a lot to build sidewalks. So um, I guess there's kind of two tracks there, right? There's the, the BCA piece and the patterns we're seeing there for um, the exceptions. And then there's also the fee and lieu. So I, maybe, uh, Mr. Briggs, can you just speak to uh, the BCA process and what we're doing there to improve? Prove that and some updates we're looking at. Sure. Uh, so as you all know, um, the the sidewalk ordinance uh, it, it really stiffened the requirements uh, where we are requiring sidewalks um, for development. Um, I think, sort of anecdotally, um, between sort of commercial multifamily development, um, I think we've heard few complaints about it. Um, there's some issues that we're talking about w uh, with Council Member Henderson on uh, renovations um, and interior rehabs um, where sidewalks are being triggered on that. Um, and uh, Mr. Briggs, let me clarify. Uh, home renovation never, ever triggers sidewalk. No construction um, with it, it only at a order of magnitude um, would trigger a potential dedication of pedestrian easement. Um, that fact, I think, has created some confusion. And that's something that we're looking about maybe just taking out of uh, the ordinance. That was something that the builder stakeholder community actually suggested. Um, but just to clarify, no home renovation ever triggers sidewalk construction requirements. Thank you. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, really the way we look at it is commercial multifamily um, or non-residential uses and then one and two family. So it's sort of broken out um, into those subsets as to the requirements. Um, so on the commercial renovation and um, we are, are assessing that right now um, because the, the language in the legislation talks about assessed value and so we're doing a little bit of research to figure out what's the appropriate uh, threshold um, for uh, renovations, commercial renovations to trigger sidewalks. On one and two family um, homes, I think we, we have heard uh, probably 
just more grumblings about it because it really uh, stiffened uh, their requirements. Um, it's we're looking at it uh, from several perspectives. Um, one of the issues um, that has become apparent um, is when developers come in and do one lot within a block, um, we're often dealing with stormwater issues that are much bigger than that one lot on that block. Um, so a lot of times we're, we're maybe seeking out or trying to uh, get the Enlufi. Um, then we often will get pushback then on the Enlufi amount. Um, the amount though that is being collected um, per our data showing new sidewalks and repair sidewalks, it doesn't fully cover that. Um, and so we're, we have a tough balancing act where we don't have the authority to do impact fees. Um, and, and frankly, probably an impact fee in this instance would be a, a way of um, distributing that cost or that burden more f uh, equitably and more fairly um, across developers and, and basing it on uh, an amount per unit, for example. Um, so I think we're looking at ways, uh, because lots that do have large frontages um, often have a very high um, and loofy, and it's based on the actual costs to install sidewalks uh, by Metro. Um, and, and one can has a very valid argument if they are just doing a single family structure that the cost is really high. Um, it, it's, it's different in a case where you're doing multiple units and it, it's spread across uh, that same frontage across a number of units. Um, so planning is committed to working with the council member and the council um, to look at these issues and see what, what needs to be tweaked. Um, you know, it, there's going to be some things I think administratively or procedurally that we can do to help with the process and make it work um, a little smoother as well. Um, and uh, there's also some things I think in terms of what's triggering sidewalks that, that we can look at um, and do improvements. But uh, right now we're meeting with the council member. Um, we're getting back with the department, so talking with codes, uh, stormwater. Uh, public works um, on these issues and, and trying to, to figure out what uh, what tweaks we need to make. Mr. Hammond, can we just segue to then sidewalk cost? You provided us with a handout, um, but it was not really reflected in, in the presentation. And so can you just sort of speak to that community concern of, you know, why do sidewalks cost so much. I know um, through the walk and bike uh, strategic plan um, and the community outreach, that was something that we often heard. And when we looked at the kind of peer cities uh, report um, from uh, the, the consulting firm, um, recognizing that, you know, every city calculates it differently. It was kind of hard to get apples to apples because, you know, the topographical issues, the departmental organization was stormwater uh, in, in part of the calculation, right away acquisition, um, you know, which we, uh, you know, go and, and pay everyone for that property. We don't take that property. And so, you know, all those factors, um, uh, I think, contribute to our costs being on the higher end. And, and, you know, uh, people will speak to, uh, you know, the, the consultancy aspect of the work. And so can you just kind of speak to um, our sidewalk cost and, and as well some of the positive things you're doing um, as you look at uh, renegotiating those contracts on the design build um, front? Sure. Um, I don't know if it's unique or not to Nashville, but we certainly have a growth pattern and an infrastructure pattern that presents with us some very real challenges when we come back in years after the fact, after these neighborhoods and these streets have been developed and try to uh, implement sidewalks at that point. One of the biggest challenges, maybe the biggest challenge, is the stormwater issue. So this is not just building sidewalks, this is actually uh, reconstructing the road to a more urban cross section uh, which uh, consists of a closed drainage system. So right now, if there's if there's no if there's no curb, you know, water just flows. The road is crowned. Water flows to the outsides, collected in a ditch, and the, the ditches have culverts under everybody's driveway, and it and it goes uh, along the way. Uh, as such, when we come in and want to build a sidewalk, that does not happen. We we now have to uh, go in and and bury a closed drainage system. So you've got storm grates, inlets, pipe that carries storm water. That all has to drain to to somewhere tie into the existing storm drainage system wherever that may be. 
that then triggers a whole bunch of other things. We, we now are, are going down and, and are digging and excavating in places where there might be water lines, there are sewer lines, there are utility poles, trees is a huge issue. There are any number of things as we now have to widen the road because many of our streets are not wide enough to just put a sidewalk in where there was once asphalt. Uh, these become many roadway widening projects and um, you know for every one of these that we get into that's why when we talk about it's a it's a 30 million dollar program these are capital projects in their own right and that we are we are rebuilding uh, most of the streets that we touch along with that we have property impacts for every project we have about 700 parcels uh, being impacted right now with the projects where we're working. So it's a tremendous undertaking. And, and so when we look at the cost of the sidewalk, we're not just talking about that five or six or eight feet of, of concrete. Um, uh, we like to say that's, that's what we do when we're done with the project is actually pour the sidewalk. Uh, the, the real project here is the widen, effective widening of the road and building the, the, the necessary uh, infrastructure that's all underground that you don't see. That's the very costly part. A good planning number that I always think about when someone says, what would it cost to build a sidewalk here? I use $1,000 a foot. Now, that's not seeing it, but that's kind of a, 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 a case where, you know, we do a lot of what we do in the, in the uh, like in the picture that you're seeing here. Um, we can't speak to other cities uh, because we, we could also make that number look much, much lower if we just talked about the, the sidewalk that comes at the end of the project. Um, it's also not a very good comparison to talk about that $1,000 a foot, which sounds very high, and it is. It's, it's very expensive. Uh, when, we, when we go back and talk about that previous discussion of, the, uh, of the, the, the in lieu of number, what we do to arrive at that is use that, that big construction number, but also um, uh, temper that with repairs. So a lot of what we do are, are repairs to existing sidewalks. Those, of course, are much, much cheaper. So we, we come up with a formula to, to derive that number. Mr. Hammond, if, yes, if I may, just for the viewing public, <laughs> um, if, as calculated at last pass on averages, um, the cost to Metro uh, of all projects with right-of-way acquisition removed, right? Because when you trigger the sidewalk requirement, it you have a dedication of pedestrian easement. If you took that out, it's $599. And then to your point, averaged with the repair cost so that we're not just skewing to the end of the more expensive projects, um, that came out at $110 a linear foot, averaging those together over a quantity of projects, that's how we got to $178 a linear foot. So, you know, Mr. Hammond's talking about $1,000 or take out right away exhibition, $599. You know, we have a community, and, and I, I hear the concern that that $178 per linear foot is high, but, you know, comparatively on the spectrum, we've really uh, as, as put up that calculation so that it's, you know, a fair fee, but at the lower end. So, I appreciate that. Please continue. I just wanted to clarify. It's a very good clarification, and, and it's uh, and it also highlights the other reason why we really like for developers and find it very necessary for developers to build this part of their infrastructure while they are in there doing their work. And and, and I, I know I know um, uh, derivations off of that and, and uh, are required, but uh, sometimes. But but it is very important that. that Metro not bear the total cost of every inch of sidewalk that we build in this county because it is it is very, very expensive to retrofit once once it goes right. in. Does that answer your question? Does that Councilman Withers? Okay. I'm just I guess something that I want to point out uh, since we've come on the council um, since I've been I guess public works chair the entire time some of the things that we've done this is just off the top of my head uh, but it was councilwoman uh, council lady Allen's don't block my walk legislation uh, the past two years 30 million dollars a year for sidewalks um, this past year uh, was uh, five million for bikeways uh, more complete streets uh, council lady Henderson sidewalk bill um, public works has been revamping the neighborhood traffic calming which I've got a, a question on that in a second um, we added more uh, speed and radar trailers um, and Courtney and Public Works have been doing the weekly email updates at council members, and I find that extremely informative, um, particularly as a district council member. I think that's uh, very good. Um, the walk and bike process, the uh, sidewalk tracker, and the the project tracker that Public Works has. Um, so all that to say is, um, I think y'all. I want to commend everybody here from Public Works uh, of what y'all have been doing. Um, I think us as council members, we want everything done yesterday, particularly when we have a constituent that wanted it done even before that. So um, I appreciate all that y'all do. I think it's harder 
perhaps in a department like Public Works to um, to change things because y'all are so capital intensive with some of these things, whether it's sidewalks, roads, uh, even the neighborhood traffic calming, um, as uh, we've talked about today. And um, so that kind of gets into my other point is that um, it's a lot of the things that Public Works are doing is so capital intensive and needs money, but there's even smaller things. I think it's very illustrative of the uh, neighborhood traffic calming that even $50,000 could go a long way to you know calming traffic in a, in a small neighborhood, and that can go a long way to quality of life in a neighborhood. So you know while uh, you know we throw around millions of dollars, sometimes it's just a $50,000, $75,000 project in a neighborhood could greatly improve the quality of life in an area. So I, I mentioned that now for everyone's here. I'm no one speaking to the choir to many folks, but I'm going to be uh, talking about that at budget time as well. Um, because I know as a district council member, that's one of the things that I get the most. I'm sure y'all do as well. And that's something that can go a long way. And to that point, um, and I, I guess it's for Peter or, who, or whoever. I, so y'all are revamping the traffic calming, I guess, neighbor traffic calming process and I've talked some with Amy about that um, a while back um, I guess we're in the process are y'all of revamping it and um, I guess follow up on that is you know could you share with the council members of with us how to go about that process now you know, like I know before it was you know a word document you print off and you get the neighborhood folks to sign off on it is that still what will be done or um, you know is there could it be is a council member initiated is it neighborhood leader initiated and you know that could you speak to some of that sure um, one, one of the things that Amy and I have been both um, have been working on through this um, I guess what I'll start with is, is like councilman withers said that we're, we're kind of leaning towards moving towards that uh, neighborhood or kind of zone area uh, requests or, or applications instead of just spot improvements. One thing we're still kind of gray on and fuzzy on is whether or not that's a full-scale replacement or if that's a program that we still have the opportunity for if you have a you know blind curve that people are going too fast in your neighborhood that that's still an option to be able to do um, to make a single request. And and um, I guess also what, what we're kind of looking at, what we've seen from other peer cities that, are, that have done this work and that are a little bit ahead of us is whether we keep keep moving with uh, with a rolling process where basically people can apply at any time. It goes into a queue and that's judged. Or what some of the other cities are doing is having either a once per year, twice per year kind of time frame window when those applications can go in. There are you know pros and cons to either one of those. The benefit to having it at a single time or twice a year is that we're able to whole scale look at those and really compare them to one another mm -hmm. instead of making a judgment and then you know the next week another one comes in. Um, so I think, I think those are some of the bigger issues that we're still wrestling with in the program, but the toolkit itself, I, I showed just one example of one of the treatments, but we have that pretty well designed, where I think uh, between, pan, or between planning and public works both, we're pretty comfortable with that. There may be some small tweaks, but that's something that we're pretty comfortable with. And uh, the process, um, generally, I think we're, we're pretty close, but it's just ironing out some of those small details that are really addressing kind of two or three options of how we do something, which one do we feel like is the best to try. Um, and, and I'll emphasize also that that once we start something, that doesn't mean that we're tied tied into doing it exactly like that for the next five or ten years. We can change things as we go, and we're definitely building the program in a way that if if we find that something isn't working or that it's more difficult this way or something, we can make that adjustment. But um, it, short of giving a, a time a date of when this is going to be ready, because I, I I don't have that. I think it's something that really within the next six to eight months. I don't know if that sounds like a reasonable number, Jeff, that we'd be able to to really, I guess, I guess have a first either application window or be able to start to start judging judging some of the applications coming in. And um, I think the last thing, the other thing you asked that I missed was whether that's going to be council member driven informing the application. Um, it can be. I think. I think from other cities we've looked at, there's been. You, you want to have a champion of the project, and a lot of times it is a council member, but that all, that could also be a neighborhood leader, a, um, you know, religious institution, just something that has an, an organization that really has a strong kind of hold in that neighborhood and can be that champion and kind of steer and get people on board with it. So we've never talked uh, anything about it being other than a neighbor, a neighbor-driven uh process that could change but we also like you we recognize that this is a program that is full of goodwill and we like being responsive to neighbors and giving people the ability 
to, to make those requests. One of the one of the other things, as you were mentioning, uh, uh, several of the things that we've been able to accomplish this past year that's been very helpful for us. We, we didn't do it. We're, we're users of it, uh, like a lot of folks, but it's the hub in, in Nashville that's also mm-hmm. housed within Public Works, and it gives people to, the ability to go in, make those requests online, and, and then dispatches that to us. And so we, we like to be able to re, uh, uh, refer people to that to make those requests for traffic calming. Again, as Peter said, that could change, but we, that's always been, uh, continued to be the conversation on initiating these projects. And I would, I would say that that allowing a non-resident to be kind of a, an applicant for that, probably the biggest benefit is it gets into what Michael was talking about, about the equity issues around traffic calming. That, you know, strictly to residents, it's, it's very much a squeaky wheel, uh, which isn't, you know, in itself a bad thing, but we feel like if, if there's an opportunity to be able to to have another champion who, you know, has a stake in the neighborhood, obviously, but that isn't maybe isn't it specifically a, you know, organic kind of neighbor uh, or resident applicant that that would allow us to get into areas of the city and do this work where maybe it's necessary, but that we don't have um, as vocal or, or as as able of a of an audience to make that request through the process. I apologize. I was going to say uh, two things. One is I'm, I am excited about the toolkit because I think before um, y'all have been limited to, you know, signs and painting basically. So I'm excited about the toolkit and I do appreciate the, I hadn't thought about it, but I think that's good about the equity issue because it is a lot of times, you know, the squeaky wheel or the, you know, neighborhood association that has, you know, 200 people show up to a monthly meeting, but there may be, I know parts of my district are heavy, you know, immigrant population and, you know, they don't know who their city councilman is, let alone, you know, know who, who to contact that you can contact your city government to try to get, you know, uh, the traffic calmed on your street. So I think that's um, excellent. Chair, uh, I was going to ask, Peter, um, as y'all uh, uh, look at this program, I know uh, historically, uh, you know, if you were a traffic calming neighborhood, you know, you could get the speed trailer to come out, you know. Um, and but that was not, I think, despite neighborhoods' best efforts to try to proactively align that um, with speeding enforcement, right? So you see the trailer and you know that means, ooh, you know, I, I, I need to actually slow down. Um, what I hear from neighbors over and over and over again is that people are speeding in neighborhoods with impunity. Uh, and I think that's somewhat kind of the elephant in the room sometimes with the traffic calming conversation. So I certainly understand you have to do on-street treatments. I mean, we have a lot of streets that are just designed that speeding feels right. You know, they're wide, they're, you know, your cone of vision is really, you know, all those, all those things. Um, and that we can't just, uh, you know, say enforcement will solve it, um, but that it's a multi-part um, uh, effort um, for those neighborhoods that are asking for it, right, um, uh, as it relates to speeding enforcement. And certainly we don't want people to get tickets, but we just want them to know that, you know, the number on the sign means something. It's there for a reason, from a safety perspective. Um, so, Mr. Hammond, you alluded to, um, you know, traffic calming and vision zero, that request. And so I wonder the extent to which, whether, it, Mary Beth, that's in the mayor's office or in your conversations now, um, how, uh, you know, Ms. Ms. Stone puts in her report, oh, the speeding trailer's out at such and such. But, you know, to be frank, Putting out the speeding trailer does nothing um, if it's not backed up with enforcement. And so um, I wonder uh, to what extent and how can the council help um, to elevate that conversation in a, in a positive way about how we can just balance that um, as part, not necessarily as part of that program, but in support of that program. Well, we, we, we at Public Works have an enforcement arm, but is limited to parking. As, as you probably know, we, we do not do any parking enforcement, any, uh, excuse me, any speed enforcement. All of that is done by uh, Metro Police Department. Absolutely. We, we yeah. have partnered with uh, MNPD on one project, which has been the walking district uh, uh, project. And so they, they, especially at the outset, were visible in those three neighborhoods. Uh, I don't think they wrote many tickets, which is okay with us. That's fine. Uh, it's just the presence and then giving people warnings. Uh, I think I think it's very effective. Um, oh. So um, uh, I can't say much more about it than that. Our our budget is you know, of course, does not have any uh, enforcement arm to it. But we certainly agree that 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 is uh, one of the key things. And I can say as we've looked at the responses that we do have to the survey that we did for Walking District 
people recognize it. And uh, one of the questions we had was, you know, how important do you think enforcement would be along with these treatments? Overwhelmingly, people understand that enforcement is a big part uh, of that. And so uh, we have that information. We didn't need to survey that. We know that. And uh, but uh, there's, there's not a lot we can do from from a, a budgetary standpoint, uh, helping with the enforcement issue, I don't think. Well, I think that's an issue. Um, I think Councilman Bedney, um tried to kind of advance that issue through the last budget process. And I know, you know, that's a, a challenging conversation, but I think what we hear from our precincts sometimes is, you know, we just don't have the time, we just don't have the staff. But, um, you know, I think our, our, our traffic division does a lot of responding to wrecks at peak times. Um, and so sometimes speeding enforcement, when it happens, happens, you know, at 1.30 in the afternoon and, and they, you know, not necessarily at those peak speeding times. So I, I hope that, you know, we as a council in concert with the work that you're doing as we move forward with our Vision Zero efforts, um, if we can uh, address that enforcement piece, because I think it only um, uh, helps the work that you're doing, right? And I think um, uh, sometimes that can be after all the good work is done and kind of go away and things sort of settle back in. Um, I think, uh, you know, when you've had in the past that traffic calming neighborhood designation nation. Um, I've heard neighbors feeling like, well, that should mean that um, if we've identified that this is a challenging place or there's some danger here that we, we need a little bit more enforcement. So I appreciate your perspective on that. Thank you. One, one thing that I can add to that, Councilwoman, is that the traffic calming toolkit, every, every treatment in there is a physical treatment. So that isn't speed trailers. It isn't stop sign. It's, it's, it's a way of physically changing the street, whether it's by narrowing in, having a surface treatment or an intersection, but it's intentionally designed to be treatments that either don't require or require very minimal enforcement. I with appreciate the, that, yeah. You know, with, with the Might idea well. being yeah. that if, if they're self-enforcing, then that's less for our police to have to physically enforce. That's great. I think that's a great evolution because, you know, to the points you've made earlier and Councilman Elrod, when it was just changing the sign, you know, putting up, it's a traffic calming neighborhood and we're going to put the speed limit on the street, like that it wasn't a physical change. Um, uh, you know, I know we did some edge lines, moving those in a little bit, but um, I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Council Syracuse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, thank you, everybody. Um, just two things. Um, first off, thanks for adding the updates to the weekly email list about traffic calming. That's That was fantastic to see that uh, transparency there and to see where we are with, with the particular um, projects. Um, I love seeing this updated traffic calming program and, and the, the detail. That, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, one thing, it, just giving you some feedback from uh, constituents, as I've gotten a few different neighborhoods that have uh, additional traffic calming measures in there, um, is the, 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 from a data-driven perspective, um, I, I, I might recommend and suggest, I know you've got listed uh, one through eight here as far as a new process. I almost might suggest you almost start from eight and work backwards a little bit on, on some things to, to see um, if some of the, uh, the elements that have been installed, are they working? Um, those are the communication pieces that I think would be very effective for us to, that we give to constituents that um, it's not just to do something and we leave and, and, and never look back at it. Um, it would be uh, yeah, really nice to see um, some data-driven um, uh, you know, decision making about, yeah, this worked or this didn't work and that's okay to say. And so this is what we're going to try to, to fix it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, the second thing, uh, last year uh, the administration recommended a small pool of dollars for um, uh, school projects, basically, small, small school projects. And we, we uh, reallocated that. But, I, you know, from what I understand, you, you did, did find some money to continue those, those kinds of things. Um, I think they were really effective. I had two schools in my district, uh, McGavick High School and um, uh, uh, Two Rivers Middle, that uh, did get um, some pedestrian uh, elements added, and the community really appreciated those. So I was just curious about uh, thoughts about um, that program going forward. Obviously, it's dependent on what council decides to do again, um, but I, I would certainly encourage that. And uh, they're, they're very visible. Uh, they seem very cost effective and uh, they do make a difference. Thanks. We agree. We, we, uh, we have spent about uh, $1.7 million out of, out of the current uh, funding on schools project. We have a good working relationship with um, MNPS and, and agree that uh, for the most part, 
those are quick projects. They're, they're relatively easy projects. There's no property acquisition. Uh, there, there's uh, sometimes no, uh, you know, not like uh, what we've been talking about, some of those big capital intensive, heavy construction projects where drainage is involved in all that. Some of those we can do within school property, not have to, not have to include any kind of drainage work at all. So we, we like those projects. Those numbers, when we've been able to do school projects are included in everything that we've uh, been talking about. And in fact, on your sheet, uh, that, that we, we provided for you see those school campus projects there. So there's, there's 22 of them. So those, those have really helped the number of projects. They're not uh, a major part of the dollars that we've been able to do, but again, we can go in and we can do those really quickly. We like them too. I like that to Councilman Syracuse's point and yours, Jeff, that's a, a, you know, a little bit of money can go a long way because you're not acquiring you know, new property, you're not getting into the heavy capital intensive and relocating utilities and that kind of thing. And I guess I'll some of, unless there's no other questions, um, I appreciate everyone being here and uh, giving us a presentation. And I guess just to, uh, I guess an ask from y'all is, as y'all are going through, whether it's the neighbor traffic calming process or sidewalk, um, you know, in Luffy, uh, Council Lee Henderson's bill, or, you know, other tools that, that y'all might need um, for, for building sidewalks or anything else, if there's, you know, legislation, or um, that that could help, um, even if it's fairly aggressive. I think there's an appetite. Yeah, I'm, well, I guess I'm, I'll just speak for myself. I'm willing to, you know, use some. If there's whatever it is, lean on to the uh, aggressive side of trying to get some of this stuff done because we need projects uh, uh, or sidewalks so badly in neighborhood uh, traffic calming and that kind of thing. But then also, to, I think several folks have pointed out a lot of that comes down to budget time and. Um, for those that are here, I know, I'm, again, I'm speaking to the choir, um, but, and it's gonna be a tough budget year, I recognize, but, you know, we have the large capital projects, but a little bit of money, I'll say again, goes a long way sometimes uh, for public works and for our constituents and our uh, districts and neighborhoods quality of life. So I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, unless there's any questions, uh, we'll stand adjourned. Thank y'all. Thank you. I'm sorry, Council Lee Henderson, do you have anything? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they, thank you all very much. No worries, thank you. Sorry about that. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.